Hello, everyone. Welcome to the July 2014 Professor Messer A Plus Study Group. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. We have all kinds of things to go through today. I have questions that you're going to answer. I've got about 10 or so questions. We're just going to go right through to see how much you know about what you need to know for your A-plus certification exam. We're also going to take your calls. If you're watching us live, you can go to professormesser.com slash live, and I've got all the phone numbers there on the screen that you can call. We'll be taking those phone numbers in the second part of the show. So you've got about an hour before we're taking some interactive calls. And we've got quite a bit of content to go through. There's some new things we're going to try this month. Um, in fact, I was thinking a few minutes before we went live that I'm trying some new question and answer interactive things, but I don't have a plan B in case it doesn't work. And I realized that about two minutes before we went live. So there's nothing like really going in immediately to see how is this going to work? One has to wonder if I was really thinking ahead on this particular one. I think we do. I think we've got a number of things to go through. I'm also watching what we're doing in the Professor Messer chat room, which is on professormesser.com. At the bottom of the screen, of course, are our 365 days a year, 24 hours a day chat rooms. There's one I make just for the study group called live a plus study group so if you're watching this live on youtube and you notice there's no comments there's no chatting enabled that's because it's all over on the professor messer website this is something we do every month i'd like to thank everyone throughout the month for supporting the website you've purchased our, our study guides you've bought the offline version of the courses i would not be able to keep this thing going without you that is the method that we use to keep this whole train running and uh, it's one of those challenges that is always wondering every month is everybody still going to support what we're doing and we just keep making videos and you keep supporting it and I could not be more thankful for that. As I mentioned, I will be taking live calls. So there's the numbers there. You can also get the numbers on professormesser.com slash live. Uh, one of the things people say is I, I, I really don't have the money for a study guide. I really don't have the money for an offline course. Now I say just to subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, watch and follow us on Twitter. Um, there's a, that's a great place to go to help support what we are doing. It's remarkable exactly how, how much that really does help. And I really do appreciate everybody for doing that. There is also uh, a good part of this. If you take nothing else away from today, I can at least save you a little bit of money. If you're planning to take any of the CompTIA exams, I have vouchers that you can use that will give you 10% off your exam amounts. And the exams aren't inexpensive. So getting 10% off of a CompT exam, it's a pretty good number. And if you're taking your A+, that's two exams. You have to buy two vouchers. You can get 10% off of each of those. So that can be very useful as well. So uh, something that you can stick in your back pocket there. It's kind of a sneaky hidden link I make available on these uh, study groups, but it's available all throughout the month. And you can use that at any time for any of the CompT exams. If you are watching this and you already have your A-plus exam, but you need to get continuing education credits, I also will send you a certificate of completion at the end of the, um, usually it's a couple days after we finish the end of the show. And that way you can at least see, um, get, in, get uh, at least an hour's worth of credit for this. There's a lot of things that you can do to renew your A-plus certification. Uh, the renewal will only allow you to do so many live events or webinars, but at least you could get all of those through. And I'll be giving you a special code sometime during the event today that you will send me in an email. And if that special code matches, then I will send you an email that certifies that you did indeed watch this study group. Now, I mentioned earlier, there is an offline version of my course. Of course, you can watch every single video of mine on YouTube, on the Professor Messer website. I have the entire index of everything on professormesser.com. Uh, but some people don't have direct access to the internet all the time, or you'd like to be able to take it with you, or you'd like to be able to support what we do. I absolutely have the A-plus course available in, in a DVD-ROM format. So you get a 720p, non-compressed, nice-looking a uh, high definition video that you can watch on this and it includes uh, closed captioning it includes transcripts you're able to see that i also have the transcripts and the closed captioning on youtube as well so if you're perhaps english is not your first language or you would just like to follow along with what i'm saying all the transcripts are on every one of the video pages on professormesser.com for the a plus exam 
And we've also got those built into the videos as closed captioning, whether you're on YouTube or whether you're, you've purchased the offline versions of this. Now, I mentioned earlier that we're doing some new things this time. So I'm going to be asking you interactive questions, which is something I do all the time, but I'm using a new system to do this. So in the past, I've given you a different URL every time I ask a question. Well, now I've got a much easier way to do this uh, through this product called Socrative. Uh, so if you go to Socrative.com and the room name, you log in with a student name, the room name is Professor Messer. And uh, you can go to that one page and you can just stay on that one page. And I'll cycle through all of the questions and you'll get a chance to interactively answer them and you don't have to change anything on your screen. You can stay on that single page. So you can either uh, do this online, just pop open a new browser window and go to Socrative.com, choose the student login section and put the room name of Professor Messer. There's also a Socrative student app for iOS and for Android and for Windows Mobile. How you like that one from the Windows Store? So you've got all the different options available you could ever need for your mobile devices, practically speaking. And uh, it'll. I hope. I hope as we go through this today. First, I hope it works. Secondly, I hope it's just a little bit easier to follow along and do these things. And there's some nice capabilities here. We're going to play around with this and just see exactly what we're able to do with it. So one of the things that you'll want to do is if you go to that particular link, you'll start to see some questions popping up on your screen. And I'm going to start it right now. Let's see how this works. My first question for you, in fact, we'll try this out. How long you've been studying for your A-plus certification? This is a good sample question I like to do every month. And it gives me an idea of just how much you have done with your A-plus certification. It also gives me a pretty good idea of some of the things that you can do, or at least gives me an idea of some of the things that you've been doing. Uh, some of the folks have always said, you need an option as well for uh, for people that already have their A-plus and they're watching this. So finally, it only took, what, six months for me to do this. I added that option in there. So if you look at um, the, the question itself to, to see what the options are, uh, I don't even think I have. Let's pop these up. Um, the, que the options are less than a month, one to three months, three to six months, six to nine months, nine to 12 months, more than a year, or I've already got my A-plus certification. Which is interesting because I've I've never really asked the question before. I'm not sure why I've never asked the question. Uh, but before I pull that up, let me change my screen so we can actually see it on my screen a little bit better. I wonder if I can just do a full screen there. That helps a little bit. So there's the Socrative results. And in real time, I see the updates on your screen as they're coming through. So less than a month is 21%. From one to three months, we have 20%, 10% for three to six, and et cetera, et cetera. 13% of you already have your A-plus certification. So that big group of people that I was completely missing on these earlier study groups, I'm happy to say that that we've now got those options in there. So I'm, I'm glad we were able to include that piece and have you in there with us. So I'm going to go through today. You can stay on that same page. You can... Um, you can watch what we're doing, and as soon as I get to the next question, it'll simply pop up on your screen, and you'll be able to follow along with that. I think I have the ability to do that. Yes, I seem to have the ability. It is working. Yes, the chat room is ex is just as happy as I am about this actually working. It's one of those things that I'm at any moment, I could hit the wrong button, and then what are we going to do? In the meantime, we'll just follow along with what's what's happening there and we'll see how we do if you are just getting into the a plus certification i mentioned earlier there's two exams you have to take the 22801 and you have to take the 22802 two exams and they are very different information on both of them uh, the 22801 really focuses on pc hardware networking laptops printers and operational procedures the second exam completely different type of information you have to know everything about operating systems and that includes windows xp windows vista windows 7 a lot of questions about xp and vista and 7 and and those things we'll talk about that uh, later on in what we do today security is on the second exam mobile devices is something new in the a plus series that was added a couple of years ago and troubleshooting so the troubleshooting piece of it does kind of go back to applying everything you've learned across both exams. That's really the only overlap that you'll find on any of these. If you're planning to take your exam, 
for the very first time, keep in mind that this is not a percentage correct type of exam. They have this interesting study a piece that says it's not maximum of 90 question. The passing score for the 801 is 675 on a scale of 900. So each question we think is worth a certain number of points, and then you have to get those points added up to 675. And since they are, we think they are different question values, then you're never quite certain exactly how many you need to get correct. That's what we think. Uh, the the CompTIA folks don't tell us exactly what's going on with that piece, but there is a, a, good a, good, a good chance there that that's exactly how it works. That seems to be how it works anyway. For the 22802, you have to get a 700. So there's, there's quite a bit going on that you would need to know about that. You need to, um, to look at the exam objectives, and we're going to talk more about that as we go through the study group today, because those exam objectives will tell you everything you need to know to pass the exam. If you download nothing uh, from anywhere else, which probably isn't a good idea, if you don't watch my videos, you don't read a book, at least download those objectives so that when you get into it, you will know exactly what's ahead of you and what you'll need to worry about. Uh, a real quick reminder, I, I mentioned earlier that I, I appreciated everybody throughout the month and their support of what we do on the Professor Messer website. If you are also studying for your A-plus exam, I've taken all the notes, all of the pictures, all of the information you would ever need to know, and I've compressed it down into a PDF file that gives you everything. So you don't even have to take notes if you're watching my videos. Everything you need is really crammed into here. So if you've read your book, you've watched all the videos, and you just need something that will summarize all of these pieces, I've created a study guide for you. It has everything in it from both the 22801, and I've got another study guide for the 22802, so you can get the study guide that makes sense for the exam you're taking, and it will give you all of the details. And this is also a great way to support the Professor Messer website, too. Um, we have, of course, uh, I, I do all these videos and put them out for free. We are ad-supported on our website, and it's up to you, of course, to fill in the gaps there. I wish the advertising piece could handle everything. Uh, but the realities of the Internet are, though, it, is that it helps to get that revenue coming in from everywhere. Um, the Just the, the hosting of the Professor Messer website is uh, at least over $1,000 every month. So it's one of those things that helps us keep everything going. And your support has been phenomenal. I cannot thank you enough for doing that. Let's get into some questions. Let's talk about the exam questions. And I, I went through what you are asking. So those of you that have registered for this, I asked you for a question. And many of you gave me a question or something that would be very, very useful to know regarding this piece. Uh, so I took your questions and I made questions out of it. So here's what we're going to do. The question I have for you, if you go to your Socrative app, you're about to get the next question, which is which of these would commonly be provided on an RCA connector? And the options that you have available are HDMI video, S-video, DisplayPort video, and component video. There is uh, a lot of options available for plugging in devices into a back of a computer. And on your 22801, you're absolutely going to not only un recognize what the ports look like, you need to know what they're used for. And so as you go through and you're trying to remember what all of these ports do or what they look like, you also need to know what they do and have an understanding of how they interrelate with each other. This is really, really useful to, to work with. There is, is quite a bit you can do with these pieces. We've got uh, a lot that we could we could plug in. So let's let's see what options are available. We've got many of you already answering the HDMI video, the S video, DisplayPort video, component video. There is what is it? What could possibly be? No no answering in the chat room, please. Thank you for thank you for not answering in that chat room. There is there's quite a bit that you do have to look at. If you go through all of the different interfaces you have to know for the A-plus exam, there's a lot of them. So keep in mind as you're, as you're working with the A-plus certification that if you're not familiar with them, uh, you will certainly need to be able to, to uh, learn all of those different interfaces. Now, fortunately, there's not a lot 
of different options that you have to worry about uh, from a port perspective. It's a finite number. And I mentioned that study guide or the, uh, the um, not the study guide, but the CompTIA's exam objectives PDF. Their exam objectives tell you exactly the interfaces you need to know. Let's see what you guys said. If we can see here. Let's see if I can make this zoom up a little more on my screen. That's a little bit better so we can really see what's going on. So for HDMI video, we had 3% uh, of you said, yeah, it's HDMI. That's what you use this connection for. And in fact, in this case, it's your RCA connector that this would be going over. 15% uh, of you said S-Video. 5% said DisplayPort Video. And the vast majority of you were absolutely correct. 76% of you or so said Component Video. And that's absolutely correct. Now, the, the RCA connectors can be used for a lot of different things. They can be used for audio. They can be used for video, but very specific video types usually. Uh, they could even be used in some cases for other types of video displays as well. But in this particular case, the answer is component video. And in the chat room, folks are saying, hey, you can select multiple answers in the front end for this. It's absolutely true. But all of the questions I'm going to ask you today will have one answer that is correct. If I ever ask a question that requires more than one answer, I will put at the end of the question, choose two or choose three, which, by the way, is very similar to the experience you will have on an actual CompTIA exam. They tend to um, ask the question and then tell you how many possible answers it might be. So very useful to, to have that there. RCA connectors are, they look like this. So there's what an RCA connector would look like. It, these, these funny single pins, and usually there's a color ring around it, especially if you're plugging in other types of cables. You're going to need to look at that color and make sure it matches with the color that is on the interface that you're plugging in. We're going to look at those cables in just a moment. These have been around forever. They were created by RCA, which is why we call them RCA connectors. They are usually, you'll see this used for composite video, which is a single yellow video connection. That's it. One wire gives you this analog video going in. It's not very good video. This is not HD we're talking about. The HD piece is component video. Those words are so so similar to each other. But keep in mind, component video is HD type signals. It is the three RCA connectors that are used for luminance and sync, blue and red. And those are, are in fact, my, uh, my little piece, my uh, my video connector on my cable box, uh, I have the option. I could use HDMI or I can connect to my television through component video. You probably have a similar thing on the video devices that you have. Very useful to have. They look a little bit like this. So if you look at those particular connectors there and they just they just slide right in notice there's no locking there is no uh there's no special type of other connection that goes on there you're simply plugging it and that's it you're there's nothing that can prevent that from being pulled out although they do go in there pretty tightly uh, but there is there's a challenge with some of those things Let's try another question. I think we're getting good at this uh, now. We've got the we're rolling through there. I have a number of you that are that are working with the the Socrative front end. Um, there is there's quite a bit we're doing on this piece. So let's let's go to another question. And the question I have is this: Which of these command lines would check a disk for bad sectors and attempt to recover readable information? On your two twenty eight oh two, there is. Uh, a, a lot of command lines you have to know about. And the command lines, um, and, and you're going to have to know the command lines and all of the different options that you would have. So your options on this one are check disk slash F, check disk slash R, check disk slash D, and check disk slash recover. It's one of these. One of these is check disk. So at least we know that part. I tried not to throw a lot of curveballs at you on this one, but I was really interested in knowing, do you know the different options, the different flags, the different slash values at the end of the command to see what is there? The, the idea is that you need to be able to not only check a disk, but maybe also go to the, the disk itself and see if there's any readable information that you can check for in each individual sector. So this may take a long time to run, by the way. If you run this command properly, it will check through the logical layout of your disk and, and all of the files that are there. 
Then it goes through every single sector and does a check on every physical sector of the drive. So there could be a lot of time, especially if you have a very large drive with a lot of sectors on it, you'll you'll see it'll take a long time to go all the way through every aspect of the check disk command if you did this one correctly. So let's see what you thought the answer was. And, and again, no no mentioning in the chat room. No talking in the chat room about that one. I think you guys are doing pretty good along those lines. We've got about uh, 40 people that have answered. So let's see what you think the answer is. And if we go to that list, uh, we've had 32% of you said check this slash up. The check this slash R is 61%. Check, check this slash D, 2%. And slash recover, 6%. Well, I didn't fool anybody on the slash D or the slash recover. You guys were way ahead of me on that one. But we seem to have a differing of opinion on the slash F and the slash R. Hmm. So which one is it? Well, let's look at the check this command. If we look at both those two options, the, the check this slash F fixes logical errors in the, in the disk file system itself. Now, it's not looking at physical disk pieces of information. We're really looking at the logical layout of NTFS, the logical layout of FAT32, that disk system that's running on that computer. That generally takes, a, or relatively speaking, takes a short period of time. And that is it. It doesn't check any of the physical sectors of the drive. If you want to check the physical sectors, you need to run a check disk slash R. This performs the same logical check of the drive itself, of the file system itself, then it goes to every single sector and begins bringing up every single sector to be able to do this. If you'll notice that if you're doing something on the drive or something has locked the volume, it will give you a message like the one on the screen here, which is kind of hard to see, but it says, let me zoom up on this. There we go. It says that it can't run because the volume's in use by another process. Would you like to schedule this volume to be checked the next time the system restarts? And you can say yes or no. And then when the system restarts, it will bring up a, a screen that looks a lot like this, where it goes through and begins doing a check. This one happens to be NTFS. It's checking the disk, verifying files, indexes, security descriptors, USN journals, and file data. So you've got an idea from here what it's going through. Now, if you don't do the, the slash R, then it's not going to verify the data itself. It'll stop after it finishes the USN journal verification. So that's... That's one of the things that's very useful. For, so for those of you that went to the, and you chose the check this slash R, you would be absolutely correct. So you can give yourself a gold star on that one. There's quite a bit there to, to work with. Very, very useful. All right, another question. Let's keep this party going. Question for you is, what of which of these tools, or what of these tools, I guess which of these tools would be the most appropriate when working with 110 blocks. And again, we've got, let me let me go to the next question. Here we go. What of these tools? What, I'm not sure what I was thinking. That's what happens when you sit down the night before you do a study group with uh, with a, a drink of choice and you begin putting, putting words in here. Eventually, the English language doesn't become very important anymore. So uh, I've got a list of things. When I'm talking about 110 blocks, you're going to need to know what 110 blocks are. And then secondly, you're going to have to know what's used with 110 blocks. And the options available are punch down tool, loop back plug, multimeter, crimper, or null modem cable. 110 blocks. This is one of those things. This happens to be, uh, I think it's a tools question. It might be on the networking side of the yeah, we just did a 22802. This is a 22801 question. So I, I switch them back and forth. We'll do a 22801 and then a 22802. That's one of those things that can help you along those lines. This is um, something you will absolutely work with if you do anything in networking. There will be 110 blocks. And you're going to need to use one of these networking tools, one of these networking things to be able to work with this. There is... Um, a very interesting piece of, that as you go through this and you log into the, the Socrative, you don't need to be, uh, you don't need to sign up, by the way, for Socrative. If you'd like to join us on answering these questions, you don't have to register. You don't even have to give your real name. You only have to go to the student sign on link. As I say here, you'll look at the top of the page, be a student log on link and just type in the room name of Professor Messer and it should let you right in. So let's see what 
what your answers were. If we go back to our live results, you can see that most of you said punch down tool. Some of you said 4% said loopback plug, 4% said multimeter, 4% said crimper, and 2% said null modem cable. That's pretty good, I think. We got a, a good mix of those results on there. But obviously, the vast majority of you were not fooled at all by this question. You absolutely chose punch down tools. The, the punch down tool itself looks a little something like this. It is a, 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 as the name implies, it punches the wires onto the block itself. If you ever go into a data center or a comm room or you're walking by and you sounds like somebody's got a hammer that's just banging on the wall, it's there's a huge amount of noise going on. They're punching down some wires. That's exactly what's happening. As they're pushing it down, there are these little little tiny uh, um, little tiny hammers inside of this punch down tool that's pushing the wire into this very small area to break around the insulation of the wire and create an electrical connection. And it does it very fast. This particular punch down tool that I'm showing does a whole block at one time. Very, very useful to, to have that available. It also has a little knife on it, a little a cutting tool on it. So as you're punching it, it's not only pushing it into the block and cutting the insulation and creating that electrical connection, it's also cutting off any excess wire. So if you go and you see these punch down blocks on the wall and you look down at the floor, there'll be these tiny little pieces of wire all over the floor that were left there. Because if you're like me, you're not very good about cleaning up after yourself. The punch down blocks themselves look something like this. I mentioned it's got these, these little connectors on it. Let me zoom up. So you can see there are wires that have been laid out very carefully. So thinking about an RJ45 connector, and we always talk about pin 1 through pin 8. Well, you can almost see where those pins might be. So you'd use four or five or more of these. Depending on the block you have, you'll have a certain number with each section of these. There's a blue and a white and a red and a white and a green. So it's just something to help you see where the wires are. Notice it doesn't necessarily even have to match what wire you're plugging into it. You just have to remember what the pin was associated with it. You put the wires all on top of it, just gently put it on top, and you punch it down with a punch down tool. It shoves it in between these sharp little connectors. It, it breaks the connection uh, or breaks the insulation on the outside to make the electrical connection. And then it cuts off all the wires. You can see all the wires are neatly sliced right there at the bottom. So that that's a very common way when you're working with those those punch down tools. That's a 110 block. There's also a 66 block. And I've got pictures of these in my videos. And of course, you can go back and see that as well. If you're watching this video for CEU credits, you'll want to go to the top of the Professor Messer website. There's a contact us link and you'll want to send me an email. The special word that you'll want to put in that email is the word punch down. That at least will get let me know that you've been watching and I'll be able to send you a certificate that gives you an hour of time for watching the study group. All right, we got more questions. Let's go through some more of these. We're not even halfway through. We got to we got to speed this up. Let's get things going. Here's your question. What kind of device uses an 8-pin lightning connection as a wired synchronization connection? If you're synchronizing something and it's going to use 8-pin lightning, what kind of device is that? And again, don't answer in the chat room. Go to Socrative.com. Click the student login. Type in Professor Messer as the name of the room. Sorry, there's a lot to type there to get to the Professor Messer room, but I think it's useful to have there. The options available on this are Samsung Galaxy. That might be the device we're using. It might be an Apple iPhone. It might be a Google Nexus, or it might be a Microsoft Windows phone. I tried to give you a, a lot of different options available to see that piece. So this is device using this 8-pin lightning connection. This is from the 22802 in that new mobile devices section I was talking about. Mobile devices requires that you understand synchronization. You understand how to set up email on these devices. You understand how people manage them and some of the capabilities of what the devices are. There's a GPS. There is uh, um, there's gyro capabilities inside of these. What type of screens are used on these? These are all the things you must know when you work on that. I think this this Socrative seems to be 
working pretty well for us so far. Thanks for everybody for you're effectively beta testing this with me. So uh, I like that it uh, is doing that for you. There's one place to go now instead of having all these separate URLs as we go through this piece. So the the eight pin lightning, it, it's one of these things that if you're using it, you know what it is. Uh, if you're not using it, you probably don't. It's such a unique name. The name lightning was a more of a marketing term that was created just for these particular devices. Um, very interesting that we have these types of connectors these days. Let's see what the results are then with about 50 of us that have, uh, have voted so far. We have uh, Samsung Galaxy at 9%, the Apple iPhone at 82%, the Google Nexus at 4%, and the Microsoft Windows Phone at 5%. Well, that just looking at those numbers, we can kind of see, indeed, really wasn't fooling anybody with those Clearly, Apple iPhone was the answer when we talk about using that, that lightning connector. There's all kinds of connectors for mobile devices, as, as if we didn't have enough connectors to worry about on our computers themselves. These mobile devices have tons of connectors as well. Uh, iOS uses both USB and proprietary type connections. There's uh, On the older iOS devices are those big Apple 30-pin connectors that you see here, but they also use this 8-pin lightning connector. The 8-pin eight, eight lightning being the newest, newest of the versions What's nice about that connector is you can plug it in and you don't have to plug it in on a particular side like you do with the USB or even with the older Apple 30 pin. You know, USB, I'm always plugging in the wrong way first and then the second way, well, that doesn't work either. So I have to go back and I had it right to begin with. I think that was the whole, the whole purpose of designing USB was so I'd have to plug it in three times before it ever connected. The other connections here, of course, you can do synchronization over wireless on practically all of these devices. So don't forget that particular option is there as well. And you can also, in some cases, especially with uh, iOS, you can synchronize your entire phone to iCloud, which is Apple's cloud-based synchronization service. You can have everything backed up there, which is great. If you lose your mobile device, you simply buy a new one, log into your iCloud, and everything gets pulled back down. You don't lose any bit of data. There's other options like this for Android as well. Android generally uses the international standard. I say international standard. Everybody but Apple uses the standard of a micro B USB type uh, connection. You also, of course, have wireless connectivity there and your mobile network can be used as well to synchronize across those. So as you're, as you're going through your 22802, especially that mobile devices section, make sure you know what interfaces are used and what options are available on these interfaces for synchronization. Uh, you don't have to know a lot of details about troubleshooting or setting up or doing a lot of the specifics of the actual synchronization, but you do need to understand the synchronization process. You need to understand the types of interfaces that are used and the differences across the different operating systems. Very, very useful to have that there. Well, let's shift our gears back to the 22801, and I have a networking question. I, I do a lot of networking, and when I started doing the study group for this month, I looked down, I had like five networking questions down. I wasn't really helping folks very much. Uh, that That's one of those things that, uh, that I had to go back and erase all the networking questions, and but I did manage to keep one of them in here because this does come up, and it did come up in a lot of the questions you asked this month, and the question is, which of these subnet masks would be the decimal equivalent of a slash 16? Again, no answering in the chat room, but if you do go to the Socrative.com website and you go to the Professor Messer room, you'll be able to see the question and answer the question that is there. Slash 16 subnet mask. So now you have to know subnet masking. Now, fortunately, the A plus exam does not require that you know a lot about subnet masks, which is good. I don't have to go through and do a lot of subnetting. I don't really have to do any subnetting on the A plus exam. You'll get into subnetting on the network plus exam, and you'll have to know a little bit of that on the security plus. But with networking, you definitely need to know what the very broad terms that are used for subnetting. And you especially need to be able to recognize CIDR block notations like slash 16 and how that would look in a decimal form. The options available on this particular quiz are 255.0.0.0, a 255.255.0.0, a 255.255.255.0, and I think I even have one of 255.255.255.255. I think I covered the bases 
on that one. We've got one of everything we could choose. Uh, so how did we do? We've got we've got everybody answering now. Let's see, everybody's now logging into the soccer tip. It's great to be able to see everybody in there. Thanks for for doing that as well. Let's see what we answered. So it's a slash 16. And the responses that we got were, here we go, 255-000, uh, 7% said. 255, 255-000, 56 said that. 255, 255, 255, 0, 32%. And all 255s is 5%. So those of you in the outliers, it's definitely not the 7%. It's definitely not A. It's definitely not D. But we're sort of torn between B and C, aren't we? We're wondering, is that really going to, which one of those is it? It's a really good question. So let's look at a table that I created for the A-plus videos that I do that really breaks this down. Uh, we won't go into a lot of details about classes with subnets and the old class style system, but it is a type of methods, uh, it's a type of terminology we use. Even though the subnetting is not done automatically these days, we do tend to specify classes of IP addresses in more of a descriptive way. And somebody will say, if it's a class A a subnet mask, what they're really saying is that it's a 255.255.0.0. See it off to the side there. Class B is 255.255.0.0, and class C, 255.255.255.0. The number of bits that are in the subnet is everything after this after the slash. So in the question was a slash 16, which means there's 16 bits of a subnet. And one of my videos goes through how you would do a binary calculation and you physically write down the bits and calculate everything. You can see I have a, a column here that does specify the network number bit field. A slash 16 is a class B subnet, as we have traditionally called it. And it is a 255.255.0.0. So if you are one of the 58% that did answer that 255, 255, 0, 0, you were absolutely correct. So kind of nice to be able to, to throw a networking question out there from time to time. I think that's one of those things that whenever I'm trying to do the networking piece of it, um, there's, there's a lot there. The A-plus has a lot of networking. Obviously, Network Plus, uh, extensive networking piece. And even the Security Plus has a good bit of networking inside of it. So you do have to know all of those pieces for your A-plus certification. That's from the 22801. And that is one that's going to be able to provide you with um, uh, subnetting. You have to understand CIDR block addressing. There's a good bit of networking piece. Network connections, you need to know those. Again, connectors always seem to come up. It's one of those things that once you start working with connectors, though, you kind of get used to using the connectors. It's sort of a, a normal thing to be able to work with these. It's the 802 exam where you're actually typing in networking commands that tends to be a little bit more difficult for most people. And uh, it's it's this uh, performance-based questions that you may be asked. As, as you've probably seen on the CompTIA exam, you might be asked multiple choice questions, but you may also, you will get a number of performance-based questions. And on the 802 exam, a number of these performance-based questions may have you do something in the Windows operating system in the front end, or they may pop open a uh, a command line. You have to type in command line information. There's there's a lot of things associated with that. Well, my friends at GTS Learning have thought of this as well, and they've created a series of labs that you can step through all online, completely virtual. You don't need any software on your computer. You don't need anything to, to run on your systems. You don't have to have operating operating system disks. You can learn all about this and try it free for an hour at professormesser.com slash freestyle labs. There is uh, a lot that you can learn just from these pieces. The labs themselves are completely online and virtual. You are you are actually running in a real version of Windows. This is not a simulation. It is a virtual system. You're running, and, and it's always online. It's in the cloud. So all you need is a browser. You pop open your browser, and you're running. Nothing's written to your hard drive. You don't have to write anything. You don't have to download any programs. There's nothing special that you have to have there. Um, it's very, very elegant in its operation. Uh, and, and even better is the folks at GTS Learning have really spent some time with this. Let's, let me show you this piece. It really is remarkable. I'm, I'm logged in right now to the, the Freestyle Live Practice Labs. 
So let's try these out. This is the G2802 labs where I can introduce Windows 7. There's a system administration lab, a user account management. User account management, that can be a bit of a challenge. I'm going to, to click on that user account management link. And it brings up on one side of the screen are the lab descriptions. And I can step through what all of the labs are. I can even pop this out to a larger window and view it uh, in a different view if I wanted to. Um, I've also got on the left side of my screen, though, a list of machines. Here are these computers that are in the lab. They, they are, all, are all associated with the pictures that they have of the lab itself. And I can power on the devices just by clicking on the device and clicking the power button at the bottom. And I know they're powering up because they're orange right now. And orange next to the name means that they're powering up and getting ready. So this is as if we had three separate machines sitting on our desk. And we just went to all three of those machines. And we turned on the machines, all three of them. And we're letting them launch Windows. But of course, I don't have to have anything configured on these. They're already set up for the network. They're already running. If we look at the labs themselves, uh, they even have a download. We could download the PDF and have a look at it if we wanted to. So on this lab, I'm going to do that. I think I've done that before. Steps you through user account management module. Here's everything laid out. We connect to the lab, um, and we go through the pieces of it. So exercise one, you create local user accounts. You power on and you connect to PLabWin701. Well, I'll just pop back over here, and we're going to let all of these now power up. And when they power up, now I can connect to Windows, and, it, and it's a full Windows operating system. Um, I've got my domain controller just started up. Let's connect to that one just to see what's there. My Windows connected startup. Oh, I'm not even running HTML5 on this machine. I'm running the Java version. Let's run the HTML5 version just to see if that's going to work the way I want it to work. And let's start the Windows front end so I don't need the Java piece. There, boom. That's much faster than Java 2. I'm now connected to Windows. I can now go to the Start menu. I can do, oh, we got set a network connection. I've got my control panel. I've got my network settings. It's a full Windows operating system. And it's all available for me to, to use right here. Very useful to have that. And one of the nice things um, that I've been doing, I've been working with the folks from GTS Learning for years. And they've given me some special pricing on this. So instead of the normal price of the, the labs themselves, it's $99 to get one year of access to these labs. You also get access to their freestyle, which is their entire ebook all online. My videos are embedded into that ebook online, and they have sample tests that you could go through. A lot of things that you can have available to you, um, and you can try it for free and see if it works for you. If this is something you want to do, you'll know very quickly. You get one hour that you can use this for free. Go to professormesser.com slash freestyle labs and give it a shot. That's uh, just something that might help you through those performance-based questions on the CompTIA exam. Let's go through some other questions. We've been doing quite well with stepping through our questions today, and I have a troubleshooting questions for you. So let's we'll start up and look at these. So when you start your computer, the screen remains blank, and it beeps twice. Which of these would be the most likely cause of this issue? So if you go to the Socrative.com website and go to the student login under the Professor Messer room, the options available to you will be the boot device is not connected, the memory is faulty, the operating system has become corrupted, and the PC is infected with malware. So now we've got... Now we've got a bit of a troubleshooting piece to do. Because I'm looking at this and thinking, what could it be? This, uh, remember, it starts your computer, screen remains blank, beeps twice. We've got a number of things this could be. Now you've got to decipher from just that very little bit of information what it could possibly be. The, uh, the idea of using this is, uh, or troubleshooting this, is an important part of the 220802 exam. There's an entire section on troubleshooting. And they're going to give you questions like this where it's just the bare minimums of what you need to be able to answer the questions. I've had a number of people this month come into the chat room and say, the questions are trick questions. Oh, no, no. They're not trick questions at all. If you are following very carefully what they are putting in the question and you're looking at all of the answers, only one of those answers is ever going to possibly be correct. And it should jump right out at you and let you know what is going on with that particular question. You do have to sometimes read them multiple times to make sure you understand this. And that's an important part of the exam is that is that you take your time, you read through the question, and I tend to use the, the option to check off or have a particular question marked so I can come back to it. If I really didn't understand it the first time, maybe a subsequent, subsequent question might jog my memory, and then I can go back to that question and see what I missed. Let's see how we're doing here. 
I mentioned that the, the question is, when you start your computer, the screen remains blank and beeps twice. Which of these would be the most likely cause of this issue? 28% have said the boot device is not connected. 65% said the memory is faulty. We got 7% said the operating system has become corrupted. And 2% said the PC is infected with malware. I guess we've had enough malware infections that at this point, we're pretty sure that's not what it is. The 2%, I'm afraid that was an incorrect response. The operating system become corrupted. Only 7% said that one, the operating system being corrupted. So we've got two choices here to choose from. We've narrowed it down now to two. One is the boot device is not connected, and the other is the memory is faulty. Now, more people have said memory is faulty, but let's go back and look at the boot device is not connected. If a boot device was not connected, which means we don't have a, a, a hard drive connected, an SSD connected, or even a USB or DVD-ROM or CD-ROM connected that is bootable, then normally what we would expect to see is a message on the screen that says, I'm not able to find a boot device press a key to continue and, and go along those ways. Not having a boot device doesn't mean that I can't see anything on the screen. And that was your clue when it said the screen was blank. Well, that means something functionally in this computer is not allowing it to display information to the screen. And a boot device not being connected, wouldn't do, that would not happen. You would still see information on the screen. The display's connected to it. Everything else is working. It would be able to show us that. The memory being faulty is the correct answer here. Uh, there could be many things that are going wrong, but of the choices you have available, that is the only one that would cause the computer to start up, show nothing on the screen because there's no memory to run anything to be able to run executables. Uh, the memory is faulty. Uh, there's no memory. Maybe it's it's the memory is, is defective in some way, uh, and it would cause, instead of showing information on the screen, the motherboard is designed to simply beep at you with a number of codes, a number of beeps that, that is correlates back to what the manufacturer says. If it beeps three times, the memory is faulty. If it beeps two times, then you have a problem with this. There's different, um, different devices will have different um, options available. There, there's a number of things that the, the BIOS is, they're all different between all of them. So I think that's really useful to be able to, to do that. Uh, one of the things that, that I start getting into and start working with, um, these, are, these are real challenges on the motherboards is every motherboard's a little bit different. I just installed a new motherboard that had multiple BIOSes inside of it. So if I was doing a BIOS upgrade, I could switch over to the other BIOS and work with that. So it was a, it was a nice uh, safety check. So I could boot up with a different BIOS. I didn't have any problems with that. So uh, whenever you get into beeping problems, it's generally a BIOS situation. Uh, the BIOS is telling you what's wrong with those pieces. Very, very useful. Let's go to another question. I got plenty of questions to go through. Um, we're going to do another networking question because I just can't get enough of it. That's why. There's a, there's a lot of network things that we could go through. So this is a big, long question too. So you're planning a network installation and I'm going to Click so you can see this on your Socrative. Play, playing a network installation on the floor of a manufacturing facility, you expect the network run will be less than 100 meters. Which of these cabling types will be the best choice to guarantee that the manufacturing equipment will not electrically interfere with the network link? So you got a lot of information to pour through. There is a manufacturing facility. We need a network link. It's less than 100 meters. Uh, you've got to read the entire question. No, we've got manufacturing equipment, electro interference, the length of the of the entire piece, read it and then examine the different options available because you've got a choice of STP copper, multi-mode fiber, single mode fiber, or UTP copper. So you've got a number of things you could you could go through, different options available on the network side. So if you were planning a network setup and configuration and you were running cable, what cable would make the most sense to be able to have this here? If you were running a connection, there's one connection type that can really be the best choice for what we're doing here. There's a lot of them there to be able to work with that. There's a, a number of different things that, uh, that you could consider. In fact, in this particular case, a number of the options, in fact, I'm going to look at the four options, STP copper, multi-mode fiber, single-mode fiber, and UTP copper. So just by looking at these options, I could run all of them, and it would work. I think I could at least get connectivity, but does it really solve the problem that I'm trying to solve? And that's the important part of this question is you really should go through those pieces and get that piece, uh, that piece there and be able to work with that. 
So we've got a number of, uh, of answers. Not all of you answering this one. You guys are holding back this time, thinking maybe I'm, maybe I'm not going to answer this one. Maybe I'll let the networking guys go through and answer this one. Let's see what we've answered on this one. We're going to go to the, the list here since we've got about 38 people. So uh, it, the folks said 53% uh, of you said STP copper, 33% of you said multi-mode fiber, 16% of you said single-mode fiber, and 5% of you said UTP copper. So if we look at the question, here's how we, we break this question down. It's a network installation. We expect the run will be less than 100 meters. In reality, because both copper and fiber will work in this scenario, we still have not ruled one out. So we have to keep reading. Which of these cabling types would be the best choice to guarantee that the, guarantee that the manufacturing equipment will not electrically interfere with the network link? So we're looking for a 100% chance that electrical interference will not be an issue for us. That means that both the copper connections are thrown out. Copper, whether it is shielded or unshielded, still has the capability to be interfered with to some degree. Obviously, a shielded twisted pair is going to minimize the interference, but it doesn't remove and it certainly does not guarantee that all of that interference is there. There is multi-mode fiber and single-mode fiber to choose from then. And if we're looking at a small run of less than a couple of kilometers, the multi-mode fiber is going to be your better choice. So those of you, you're 31% that answered multi-mode fiber. Yep, you were absolutely correct. The shielded twisted pair, I sort of threw a, threw a curveball at you with that guarantee. And that is uh, one of the real benefits of fiber connectivity is that it's using light. There's no worry about electrical interference. You could be have all kinds of equipment. You could be uh, with be be a, a run with fluorescent lights on top of it. It's not going to be a problem. People people could be running a microwave oven. There can be all types of electrical interference with radios. Not an issue. It's fiber. It's light. So not not even a problem associated with that. Um, you also one of the security benefits. It becomes a little more difficult to monitor or tap into that link. If you were to tap a fiber connection, the amount of light decreases significantly and you're able to monitor that on the other end. And unlike copper, you can't put an inductive piece of tap around it, not breaking the connection because it's light. You can't hear anything with the light piece. It's also immune to radio interference, electrical interference, or any type of RF interference at all. So there's the reason why we say we guarantee that's not going to cause a problem for us. Okay, we're we're moving right along. I think we got a good number of questions here. I have more questions for you. Let's do another one. Let's shift gears and go into operating systems. The question I have for you, in which of these situations would you make use of UAC? When would you use UAC? It's interesting that I chose UAC for the uh, the 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 online live lab demonstration that I was doing there. Uh, but you'll also see, of course, that um, that UAC has a lot of things it could do. But which one of these things would UAC do? Would it prevent write access to a network share? Would it limit applications for making changes to network settings? Would it force periodic updates to a Windows domain password? Or would it convert IP addressing from a public address to a private address? What would UAC do? So I like to ask you questions that have have two things you have to know. So first you have to know what UAC is, and then you have to know what UAC does. So there's there's two things we would have to step through to be able to do that piece. And that's really the the challenge we run into with the operating systems is what does UAC do? And and in UAC itself, um, sometimes a bit of a, a quandary for folks who have to deal with UAC. And for your A plus exam on your 22802 exam, you could definitely have to know what UAC is and how it affects what you're doing with everything on operating systems across the network, the way people are using machines. There's a lot that UAC can help you with. So we'll let some folks answer this particular question. Another reminder that if you're following along, we're answering those questions on the uh, on the Socrative.com website. Go into the student login and choose the room uh, or type in the room Professor Messer, and it will take you to exactly where we are right now. So let's see what, what folks have said for UAC. 
We said uh, 22% of you said it can prevent write access to a network share. 56% of you said it limits applications from making changes to network settings. Uh, some of you said that it forces periodic updates to a Windows domain password. And 11% uh, of you said convert IP addressing from a public address to a private address. So UAC is this uh, the, the way we talk about UAC. It stands for user account control. And if you think about user accounts, well, we're not converting IP addressing from public address to private address. That is a NAT, network address translation. It's not forcing periodic updates to a Windows domain password. That would be something more related to group policy. Uh, preventing write access to a network share are the built-in rights and permissions in the, the disk file system. So in this, or, or it could be related to groups and users in your domain configuration. And B is limit applications for making changes to network settings. The 51% of you got that one absolutely right. UAC becomes uh, very useful when you start uh, needing to control what applications can do. It was created primarily as a security tool. It is a fabulous security tool. You don't want applications being able to do anything they want to the Windows desktop because a malicious piece of software can simply grab the desktop, move to a certain spot on the desktop, run applications on the desktop without your knowledge whatsoever. So to prevent that from happening, Microsoft created UAC. So if something is going on in your system that you don't want to have happen, uh, or at least you need to be notified it's happening, the UAC will beep. A message will pop up on your screen a lot like this one that says, uh, do you want to allow the following program to make changes to this computer? It happens to be under network connections. It is Windows that is uh, running the program that is doing this. And here's what it is. And if you are not the administrator, you will need to provide the correct credentials to be able to perform that particular function. There is uh, a quite a bit that you would need to know along these lines. UAC can also be used on the administrator side. You have to have administrator access to install applications or you know, install a service or connect via remote desktop. And UAC does that. The secure desktop is what we see when the desktop goes dark and this message pops up. We call it the secure desktop. If you've ever been remote controlled into a machine, in fact, and on the other side, the secure desktop popped up, suddenly you have no access to the machine. That's by design. The user who's in front of the machine would need then to provide the correct credentials or continue through the UAC prompt to be able to do what you needed, assuming that's something that's legitimate. This is your chance to not allow a certain program to do something. And if malware is trying to do something bad, this is your warning message. So don't just click through those things. You want to be able to, to go through that piece and, and understand exactly what's happening to your computer so you can avoid any malicious type of systems taking advantage of what's on there. Well, we're getting near the end of our hour. I still have more questions for you, so let's keep things going with this particular question. I get so many laser printer questions, so I thought I would throw you a laser printer question here as well. So which of these laser printing steps ensures that you will not see a ghosted image appear down the page of your output? And for laser printers, it's one of these. It's exposing, it's cleaning, it's developing, it's charging. It's one of these is going to solve this problem for us. If you're looking at your output and it looks like the output's ghosting, like the top is clear, and the bottom is kind of this ghosted image of the top. And it kind of repeats itself down the page. And each part of the page is a ghosted image of itself. That's a bit of a problem. So how do we solve that with laser printing? That is a, a problem, of course, because the laser printer is all this self-contained unit. If you go to the Socrative website, you can go to the um, student login. You don't have to use any login name. You don't have to do a username and password. You don't even have to put your real name. Simply put some type of name and go to the Professor Messer room, and you'll be able to answer the questions along with everybody else interactively as we go through this piece. You know, the printing is a big section of the 220-801 uh, exam, 801, 802 exam. <laughs> It's the 801 exam. The 22801, the printing part of it, you have to know laser printers, inkjet printers, impact printers, thermal printers. There's a lot of printers that you have to know. Each one of these printers uses a different method. And there's a lot of questions about laser printing. It's such an unknown thing. It's all happening in a box. And you really can't see it happening. You can't really open it up and watch as it prints like you can with an inkjet or even with a thermal. You can see it printing. Um, that's a bit of a problem. So would be interesting to know in a laser printer, you kind of have to visualize what's going on. Let's see how we answered. And for this uh, 
Nine percent of you said exposing is the problem there. Uh, Sixty-five percent of you said the cleaning process is what's called causing that ghost. Twenty-one percent said it's the developing process, and five percent said charging is the thing that's really causing you the biggest amount of problems here. So, well, we've got 65% did say cleaning. So let's see if that's really the correct answer. If we look at the inside of a laser printer, there's a lot that goes on on the inside of a laser printer. And we tend to look at the steps of laser printing in these many different configurations here. You can see that I've got uh, really up to, to all of these options all together, these seven different steps of laser printing that we would have to know about. The, the first part, we tend to be the processing of the information coming into the printer. Then the printer, uh, the, the photosensitive drum on the inside of the printer is then charged so that we can then expose parts of that, that drum with a laser, which are going to change that particular section of the drum. It'll, it'll make it so that it can be stuck to in the developing process with the toner. The toner at that point is just dust. It's nothing that's permanently attached, and it sticks now because of the changes in electrical potential on the electrostatic or the photosensitive drum. Electrostatic then pulls it across, and can, now the paper comes through, and it moves off of the drum and now sticks to the paper and transfers to that. And finally, it fuses this together with heat, and it melts the toner right to the page. And that's why when you get the page out of the laser printer, it's a little warm. Now, so that you don't have any excess uh, of the toner, because some of not all of it gets transferred to the paper. There's still a little bit still stuck to the drum. We clean it before we begin the process all over again. And usually that drum has to cycle around a number of times to get a single page out. And if you leave that toner on the page and you don't clean it, then you're going to see a ghosting of that information later on down the page because it wasn't cleaned properly. And that's why. The 64% of you that said, yeah, it's cleaning. That's our problem. It's not being cleaned. We're getting this ghosting down the page. That's exactly what's going on with that piece. So now we know how the laser printer cleaning process can cause us problems, and we need to consider that when we're working with those pieces. Okay, we're going to have, let's do another question. I got, I got one more question here at least for you. And the one that I have for you is, in which of these circumstances would you use a P- E. Now, in the United States, that would be physical education, except that's not what I'm talking about. It's something else. It's PE. Now, would I use a PE if I was changing the default resolution of a Windows desktop, if I was viewing a consolidated console of system events, if I was installing and updating an antivirus utility, or if I was troubleshooting an issue using a minimal Windows operating system? So one of these PEs would be used for that. So that, that piece would be something that would be really useful. Um, to be able to work with those, those uh, the PEs can be really, really functional too. If you're doing whatever the answer is here, and we'll certainly get to that, it's always nice to have a PE if you are somebody technical who's working on your computer. comes in very handy. Uh, make sure you go to the Socrative.com website, login on the student login link, go to the Professor Messer room, and you can answer this question as well. Which of these circumstances would I use a PE. Hmm, 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 hmm. That would be interesting to see. Now, you've got a lot of things that a PE can do, but only one thing that's listed here is something that is unique or or are specialized for PE use. It's another one of those, those examples where you have to know what a PE is, and then you have to know what a PE does. Again, those multiple steps that I have set up for you. So a PE. Hmm, what is a PE? If we look at how we've done so far with this answer, we've got 3% have said change the default Windows re uh, resolution of a Windows desktop. 26% view a consolidated console of system events. 7% said install and update an antivirus utility. And 67% said troubleshoot an issue using a minimal Windows OS. So we got almost a quarter of you said view a consolidated console. So it seems to be going down as we speak. Really didn't fool the folks that said change default video resolution. You don't need something special for that. Certainly not something called a PE. And install and update an antivirus utility. I've never used a PE to be able to do that. I've always used the installation program for the antivirus or the anti-malware. So is it view a consolidated console of system events or is it troubleshoot an issue using a minimal Windows OS? Now we're just we're piling on here. PE stands for pre-installation environment. 
It is a uh, a version of the Windows operating system that could run from a DVD-ROM. You don't even you're not even necessarily running the Windows operating system yet. In fact, if you've ever run the setup program for Windows and it pops up that initial screen that says, welcome to Windows, we're going to run the setup program, that's actually a Windows PE. It's a pre-installation environment. Windows PE can also be used if you can't get Windows started. You could start a troubleshooting pre-installation environment from a DVD-ROM or a USB key if you su supports that uh, on your machine. And you can run Windows 7 type functionality in this standalone DVD-ROM or offline version, this pre-installation version of this. So it's sort of like having uh, just enough to get Windows going. It's not a full-blown Windows operating system. It's one designed just to give you at least the ability to connect to win the Windows uh, on the, the hard drive, modify things that are on the hard drive, uh, and you can make your own. If you have certain utilities you always use when you're, you're troubleshooting startup problems, you can create a pre-installation environment and put all of your utilities on that, that PE itself. There's also a number of PEs that you can download out there. Uh, BART PE is one of those, and the, the URLs there are simply Google BART, B-A-R-T PE, and be able to, uh, to see what the options are for that as well. Uh, so for you folks that said troubleshooting using a Windows operating system, you will, you're absolutely correct. Uh, that is the correct answer, and that is the one that would give you everything you need to know for using APE for this particular question. There were a number of questions that I got this month that were outside the scope of knowing things for the exam. There were more questions about the exam. And this one comes up quite a bit. It came up a number of times in the chat room over the last month on the Professor Messer website, uh, which was, when will Windows 8.1 be on the CompTIA A plus exam? And the answer to this is, who knows? It is not currently on the A plus exam. You've probably seen, and you don't have Windows 8 listed in the exam objectives. Again, download your exam objectives and you'll see Windows XP Windows Vista and Windows 7 are part of the exam. Uh, on the other side, people are saying, when is, we're obviously going to get rid of XP, right? Well, probably not. Uh, the estimates are about 25% of all desktops out there still running Windows XP. So you don't want to remove something that is, is used by millions and millions or tens of millions of machines right now. You still need to know how to troubleshoot those devices. And in fact, there's some very large customers like governments and other large agencies that are paying Microsoft to continue support for them. So if you plan to work for any of those, you better know all about Windows XP. Very useful for those. Download your exam objectives. Uh, CompTIA can change those objectives at any time. On the chat room last night, somebody was uh, speculating maybe they'll just wait for the next version of the exam a year from now to add Windows 8. Well, maybe they will or maybe they won't. Maybe they'll add it tomorrow. Maybe we'll log in, download the exam objectives, and now they're part of it. That's what CompTIA did with Windows 7 on the last version, the 700 series version. So it's uh, one of those things that uh, you never know. It's not currently on the exam. Keep checking your exam objectives. The, the real question that comes up a lot is how in depth does A plus go with these these types of topics? And all I can really say over and over again, you're sick of me saying it, I'm sure, is download the objectives. If you go to professormesser.com slash objectives, it will take you to the CompTIA objectives page. That's so a quick way to redirect yourself to that. Read through them. They will tell you everything you need to know about the A plus exam. If you can go through that list and check off, yeah, I know that. I know that. I know that one. I know that one. I know that one. Check off as much as you can. If you can check off 90%, you're ready to go take your exam. You should be great in being able to, to work with that. And another question that came in from Matt was, can I take the 22802 before I take the 22801? Absolutely. You can take them in whatever order you would like. Uh, you don't have to put them, you don't have to take the 801 first and the 802. You could do them in reverse. Uh, there's no specified time frame between them either. You just have to take both of them before they are retired. And uh, CompTIA tends to retire them every three years. We've got, a, well, let's see, we got the, the 801, 802 was officially retired, I think, in August of 2012. So if they keep the same idea somewhere around August of next year, plus or minus. We're guessing because I have no idea. I don't work for CompTIA. I don't talk to those guys. I have no special relationship with them. I can only go with what we've done in the past. And so you've got it 
probably at least a year before you even have to worry about that being retired, which means you could take 802 today and you could wait a year and minus a day and up to the very end and take the 801 and you're certified with the A+. So there's your options to be able to have those retired and and uh, when we expect to have those pieces retired. There's a, a lot to work with on the A-plus exam. There's a lot of topics. I know we do a sort of shotgun these questions at you every month. I got a lot of feedback last month that said, yeah, let's keep doing these types of questions in this first hour. And I think that's a good idea as well. But I have more questions for you too. I'd like to know what you would like me to do next time with this. So I have just a, a it's not even a fill in the blank. It's just a, a, a list of open-ended question here where you can tell me what you would like to cover next time. So very, very useful um, to have that in there and those pieces. I think that's that's uh, that helps me. So next month, I'll try to focus on the topics that are most interesting for you to be able to work with. And I think that's that helps me too, to be able to, to understand what you would like to know, what you would like to go through along those lines. And tell me what you thought of the Socrative front ends. First time we ever did it, it looks like it worked. So let me know how that worked for you. I got very interested in, in hearing your experiences with it Well, as well. I had a lot of fun playing around with it this week. I was excited. I wasn't telling anybody we were doing this. I was testing it out, making sure it worked. Everybody in the house got to load it up on their machines and we all tested it together. It was really, really a lot of fun. As you go through your studies throughout the month, I do one of these study groups, of course, every month, but every day uh, during the week, you can get a daily A-plus pop quiz from me on Twitter. Sometimes I throw other things in there as well. You can also watch everything we're doing on YouTube. Uh, go to professormesser.com slash YouTube. If you do nothing else, um, I encourage you to have a look at our study guides, to have a look at our offline products, to try the live labs for free. But if you, if you do nothing else, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, I can only tell you it helps us immensely at being able to get these things on YouTube to be able to promote them. It gets a lot of eyeballs at Google and that can only help us going forward. The study guides I mentioned can be found at professormesser.com slash A plus SG. We've got uh, quite a bit on the GTS learning side, those live labs I showed you that were instant access. It's like you're working with a local machine. There's no lag at all. It's an amazing front end. You can go see all of that and try it yourself for an hour at professormesser.com slash freestyle labs. If you want to know when we do these, I've got a calendar on the website. You can go to professormesser.com slash calendar. Now, for the this ends up our, our official first hour of the study group, but I'm now going to open up the phone lines. We have an after show, and we'll take some of your phone calls, and we'll go through with questions directly from you and get those as well. If you're leaving us for now, we appreciate you joining us. Thanks for everything that you do with the throughout the month and giving me the, the topics and the questions and everything else. It is really a lot of fun to put these together. And thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on the A-plus study group.